Howdy folks, so uh, we are going to do a IFR flight today from Invercargill to Dunedin. It's in the uh, very bottom of New Zealand. You can get a bit of an idea from the overview there. So here's the flight plan we're going to do. Um, it's essentially there is a uh, airway system that connects Invercargill and Dunedin. And uh, this, uh, uh, but there's also a standard instrument departure SID and then a star that leads into the ILS at Dunedin here. So if this is essentially what we're going to fly is this uh, IPDAB uh, two puppet departure of runway 04 and that'll uh, connect from IPDAB straight into the IPDAB 2 Bravo arrival for runway 21 at Dunedin. But uh, I'm not going to um, keep this here, I'm just going to keep it as a fairly direct route and we'll program this in the GPS directly in the aircraft. Okay, so uh, I will clear all that and I'll see you in the aircraft shortly and we'll um, program the flight plan and go from there. All right, well, we're on our way into the aircraft. We'll have a quick look at the chart here. So we're going to fly this uh, standard instrument departure. It's an RNAV GNSS SID from runway 04 in Invercargill. This is the New Zealand chart from the AIP there. So it's not your standard jet view chart, although the procedure is exactly the same, just the depiction is slightly different uh, on the New Zealand chart. So here we are in Invercargill. Here's the runway, runway 04. And uh, we'll fly this one here, the IPDAB to Papa departure to IPDAB. It's pretty straightforward. On these uh, departures, we can see there's always a sort of initial guidance, and then it uh, will lead you into specifically what you're doing. So here's our one here, IPDAB 2 Papa Departure. So that is the track 039 to November uh, Victor 404, which is a flyover waypoint. So that's this point here. So 039 to November Victor 404. And then turn right track 066 to IPDAB at or above 4,000 feet. So pretty straightforward. So Interestingly, it says track 039, so it's not heading 039. So this is because it is a flyover waypoint. They want us to fly to this waypoint, not just maintain a heading. So therefore, uh, this means that we will uh, set whatever heading we need to account for the wind so that we do fly over that waypoint. And you can see that uh, the uh, little triangles there are solid with the black, so that means it's flyover compared to EPDAB, which is not a flyover fix. Uh, on the jet, um, Jefferson uh, plates. This is actually depicted with a circle around it, I think. Uh, from memory, and we can see the MSA here, so minimum sector altitude within 25 nautical miles of the aerodrome reporting point is uh, in our departure sector here is 2,800 feet. So it's a bit higher to the north and west, 4,600. So this is the way we're going to go. So straight out, right turn, 17 miles out to IPDAB at about 4,000 feet. And uh, that's about all we need to go into there. Um, let's have a quick look at the star we're going to fly. So this is uh, Dunedin's RNAV GNSS star for runway 21. Here we uh, will be flying the IPDAB 2 Bravo arrival. So we'll quickly go through this just to save a bit of time once we get in the aircraft. So uh, we'll set this up. Uh, we can see we've got the text uh, sort of version here, but I can also just read it by looking at the points. So quite a few points on this one. IPDAB, uh, it's going to be uh, tracking to LBOX. There's a hold at LBOX, which we won't do. And then to MANOP. And then it'll be a left turn 002 up here to Bipov. And then a right turn to Losco Adkas, uh, sorry, Actas at about 5,000 feet at max 220 knots indicated. Okay, so that means we're not caring about ground speed or true airspeed, just what we see on our uh, airspeed indicator, not above 220 knots. And then a further right turn out here to Bigar at about 4,000 feet. And then right to Escat, which is the initial approach fix or the initial fix. There's another hold at Escat if we needed it. And here's the runway down here. So this will set us up for the ILS. We see it's an RNP1 um, procedure, which means we need to be able to operate to within um, a required navigation performance of one nautical mile of uh, accuracy, basically. And the MSA at Dunedin is also based on the aerodrome reporting point. Uh, it's quite a bit higher on the uh, way in. It'll be 6,000 feet sort of for this part here. As we get north of the field, it's uh, going to go to 6,700 feet. And then, uh, yeah, pretty much stays there for the approach. It's a bit lower out to the east. So there's a bit of terrain around. We can see the MSAs for the sectors are here, 4,100, 3,100, 3,7. Uh, so as long as we obey this constraint here, 5,000 feet or above at ACDAS, and 4,000 feet or above at big, uh, Bigar, then we'll be in good shape for those. And we'll just have to work those out um, with a little bit of uh, um, sort of math because we don't really have a good VNAV in this aeroplane. And finally, the ILSDME for runway 21 at Dunedin. So we can see here's ESCAT. This is the 
point that uh, the star takes us to, Escat, the initial approach fix. So Escat will fly uh, on uh, the 109 decimal nights, India Delta November is the identifier, and it's co-located with a DME, or which is this one here, of course. And uh, the inbound course is 210. So from um, Escat, yeah, we're coming over Swampy actually, which is a VOR. We'll have that tuned up just for a bit of a backup reference. Uh, the platform altitude, so that's the altitude which we cannot go below until we're established on the glide slope, is 3,500 feet. Uh, we expect to intercept the glide slope at 10.7 DME on that 1099 um, India Delta November identifier here, okay? And that's the final approach point. We make our way down the glide slope. We can do some checks along the way. At 5.8 nautical miles crossing the Moscow NDB, we expect to be at 1880 feet and all the way down to our minimum, which for us uh, is an ILS DME here. Same for all categories, it's 254 feet barrow, and so that'll be uh, setting 260 feet. Don't push anything. Here we are. Okay, Daddy's just doing a video now. Okay, can you go outside, please? Good girl. <clears throat> okay, and the last uh, thing to brief is the missed approach. So that's uh, track 211 to the Berrydale NDB and hold at 3,500. We can see it's at because we've got a line above and below. But as I say, the depiction is slightly different on a jet chart. And we can see that here, straight ahead to the NDB and hold. Um, although it's not really worth briefing, that would uh, require a reversal because you can see the hold goes the other way. So we could probably do a teardrop entry for that. And there's all the holes depicted here. MSA, we talked about before, slightly different because this is actually based on the swampy VOR, which is way out here. So the MSAs are different, but we'll just use the, uh, the star um, MSAs anyway. All right, so enough briefing into the airplane. So here we are, the TBM 930. Just to let you know, I do have the community uh, G3000 mod and also a uh, community update to the TBM 930. So the performance and depiction here may be a little different to what you have seen in your default version. And I also have uh, the Navigraph for data installed as well. So your waypoints and procedures might be a bit different as well. So we'll run through this quickly. We put the, uh, the gang bar up here, turn the battery on, most of the stuff's already set up. We've got ignitions already in auto, and uh, we can put the fuel pump into auto there as well. The fuel tank selects in auto, and we'll leave that off till we get started. We uh, only have the strobe light. We don't have an anti-collision light, and so I've talked about light usage in a previous video. We don't want to blind the ground personnel with our strobe, so we'll just leave those off. So uh, really, we don't have any way of uh, sort of indicating that we're live, except we can turn the nav lights on. I'll do that. Okay, push any key to start, basically. So we get this really nice depiction. Test. Okay. And uh, where she goes, there should be a little TORS test flag up here, which hasn't come up for some reason. Aural warning. Okay. And uh, that's about it. So we'll crank the thing up before we uh, run out of batteries. So we can see we've got good volts, 24 volts here. Uh, all pressure's flashing, obviously, because the engine's not running. So the start procedure is very straightforward. We just, it's pretty much automatic, really. We just hit the starter up the top there, look for about 13% on the NG, introduce the fuel, and away she'll go. So the parking brake is set. That's really all we need to care about. So we'll do that now. So the starter's engaged. It's showing us the ignition is on. Prop spinning. Okay, 10%. Okay, so that warning. So we've got 15 now. I'm just increasing my throttle and we'll see uh, ITTs coming up. So this is called light off or light up. And uh, the prop will increase in speed. It should be increasing. There it goes. And uh, we should get starter cut out shortly. Okay, looks like it's um, coming up there, settling into a peak. Come out of feather. All right, so that's a good start. Everything's settling down there. So if, now we just need to put our generator on, which I will do if I can find the click spot. There it goes. Just reset that while we're here. We can put our trim on, and we'll leave all that off for now. So that's pretty much all there is to it. She's running. Easy. We can put the bleed on into auto, and that will just manage our pressurization system for us. Initial separator will pop on now as well, and we'll leave these till we line up 
can do a quick check of the landing gear lights, that's all fine, and also of the DI system lights as well. And that's in fact the Nunziata lights are in the cockpit. Pop on a bit of fan just for the realism. Okay, we found that there's a little bit sticky actually in this update of the sim, it's all the latest version of everything. So nav source, obviously we want to put that into FMS, okay, we've done that. And uh, I'll set up the bearings and things later. Uh, I'm just going to put in uh, a VX of 100 knots for the departure. And we can set up a couple of other things. Map settings, we're on heading up. This inertial set takes a few seconds to uh, engage. Uh, so this is, in this G3000 version, we get heading up, which is very cool. really like it. Uh, there was something else I wanted to do. Wind option 3 has been saved from last time. That's good. AOA is on. Okay, so let's look at our flight plan here. So we've got, um, all we've got is uh, Invercargill to Dunedin. That's it. So because we're flying from a SID straight into a star, we don't need on route waypoints. So pretty straightforward. So we can just go straight into procedures. We'll do the departure here. So we want uh, the uh, IPDAB to uh, Papa off runway 04. IPDAB, Cal, so, uh, so we don't have these, we don't need these points, just November Victor 404 and IPDAB, so we can load that. And we'll just check that we've got the legs, we do, perfect. Okay, and uh, we can just go ahead and put the arrival in here for Dunedin as well. So that was the IPDAB 2 Bravo, runway 21. Now I'm not going to, so we can load that. And I'm actually not going to load the approach, and I'll, I'll tell you why a little bit later on. So we can check our flight plan again. Just notice that if you do select one of these to drag your display, it often brings up this little uh, uh, additional sort of uh, interface screen here. So if you want to turn that off, just click it again. So it can be a bit tricky to scroll. And because I've got Zoom set up, if I use the scroll wheel, I zoom in and out. So I have to sort of click and hold. So it's just getting used to that. Okay, so we can see there's our... Uh, star there so just like that i've got to get rid of that again there's all the points we'll verify those a bit later but it looks like there's got the constraints 5,000, 4,000 feet there now they are at or above but um, the sim doesn't really model that because we don't really have vnav so it's just at meaning at 5,000. but we can manage the descent ourselves so that's good we have got our flight plan in there and uh, we can just have a look at it up here as well so we'll just zoom out this is the range button Okay, it looks like there is one problem because there's two lines here. So we need to do something. We need to delete the Invercargill. There we go. All right, perfect. So it's always good to just have a, a bit of a look. Does it make sense what you're seeing? We can drag ourselves along the route of flight here and check it out. So that's all good. So because it takes us onto the ILS, I'm not going to program the ILS because that will have slightly different waypoints to lead into it and that'll mess everything up. So we can pretty much just fly it in uh, what we call magenta here in the FMS or GPS mode and then transition manually over to the ILS and uh, I'll show you that as long as the thing doesn't crash sometime before, which it does have a habit of doing. So uh, that's it. All right, cool. So we can uh, check this. Let's just, we're not going to use ATC uh, because it's just a bit of a pain. So we'll just give ourselves an arbitrary squawk code there. And uh, let's see, I can go ahead and set up the nav radios now. It's just, the more we do on the ground, the uh, less we have to do in flight. So it's 1099, enter. It's in standby, so I better transfer that. And uh, I'll put, if I hit transfer, then it brings it to the top straight away. So this is Swampy. So you can see we've identified both the ILS and the uh, VOR for Swampy, just as a backup reference. And that's all we're going to do for the time being. Okay, so I'm going to leave this one on the legs page, and I'm going to move this over to Navcom. And uh, we'll start our taxi. Okay, so uh, for the departure briefing, we're going to uh, abort for any uh, CAS items. So I'll call this the CAS, the crew alerting system. We're going to abort for any items prior to, uh, let's say, 50 knots. And after that, we're just going to stop for a master warning of some description. So I might get an ITT if I'm not monitoring that, so parking brakes off takes the light on so we just need to monitor that as we go and make sure that we don't uh, exceed the ITT so I'll show you a technique for that when we do the takeoff shortly so we check the brakes brakes are working okay, we'll do this one at 13,000 feet so we'll go and set that up now ok 
Okay, just check runway's clear. It's uh, DA62 there somewhere. Okay, someone on the runway, so we'll just wait here at the hold line and figure out what he's up to. Excuse me while I get myself configured here with my track IR. Okay, so I'll just wait for him to go. Looks like he's going off runway uh, 22. So uh, there is a windsock around here somewhere. Yeah, it's pretty much no wind, but favouring 04. So I'm not sure what he's going to go. I'll just give him a couple of seconds while I finish setting up the autopilot. And if he doesn't go, I'll just go anyway. So park and brake set. We'll cancel that warning. So as I said, we'll just go for uh, 13,000 feet for the cruise. Obviously, the TPM 930 wants to fly f higher than that. Uh, but, uh, you yeah, know, we, we're really not going to. We're just going to get a small cruise segment on this flight. So 035 is runway heading for that. What's this turkey doing? He's not doing much. So I think we're just going to have to go here. So uh, we would, of course, make our... B it's a controlled airport, this. So strobe lights go on. Put the pulse lights on. And I uh, went to backtrack here. And uh, I'll bring the transponder into else on now as well. Okay, I'll just stand by on uh, the pedo heats. Oh, he's away. Okay. <laughs> well, it was worth waiting. So he's off on 2 2. So Delta Mike Oscar enters to backtrack line at runway 04, but in fact, we would be cleared by ATC for that. We've got 2983 set. It's a shame we can't use uh, Miller bars here. I see that in this latest update, they have added uh, metric units, which is cool. Uh, however, it doesn't seem to have been ported into the aircraft, it's just sort of the interface, you can see things in metric, or in uh, metric with altimeters, uh, heights and feet, so it's a little bit of a shame, but I'm sure they'll get to fixing that eventually. Uh, so we can see we've got Swampy as the uh, um, sort of, th so these are like RMI needles, so remote magnetic indicator, and uh, so I can basically bring up two additional needles in the back with a different symbol, so the skinny blue needle there or the fat one, so the fat one is set to NAV2, showing swampy, and uh, at the moment I've got NAV1, which was that ILS, but we're beyond the range of an ILS, so we're not going to see that way out here. So in fact I can actually turn that off by coming in here, NAV, 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 off, that's cool. I'll leave Swampy there. Uh, my personal preference with uh, avionics displays is to pretty much just keep on there what I need, not to have a lot of unnecessary superfluous information. There's a huge amount going on in this thing, as we can see. So uh, we really don't want to have more than we need on there. So I've got heading set up. I'm going to arm nav, but I'll uh, just hit this toga button. You might not have noticed there's a little button there. You see the fly up bars? They disappear off the screen. And that is because it's just gone up to that initial uh, rotation pitch attitude. The way it should normally work is when you press that, uh, well it depends on the avionics suite actually, but often it just cl um, clears whatever's on your flight modes, but because nav is armed then it's it's actually stayed there. In fact, FMS is engaged, it's not even armed, it's actually captured as we'd say. So our, uh, our sort of lateral guidance is going to be following this flight plan, and uh, our vertical mode, we don't actually have one, but it should say something like TO or GA, takeoff or go around, to indicate that it's there. So as we rotate on uh, the takeoff here shortly, you'll see we'll eventually pitch up into the uh, command bar there. Okay, that's about it. So we're lined up. So uh, I'll just go ahead and set the flaps. And uh, so trim set and flaps are set. Fuel, we're on the right tank there. We've got plenty of gas. Fuel pumps all in auto. Uh, we'll put out, whoops, landing light will go on here. We've got all the lights are set. Yeah, it's really not much to set here. So ignition's in order and fuel transfer is in order. Okay, so we can put on our stall and pedo heats here. So we've just got one message on the cast there. We can see that is the uh, initial separator is on. But all of our engine instruments are okay. Props running a little slow, but that'll come up shortly. And we can see where trims are all in the green. Um, rudder trim, you don't really need any rudder trim in this, in the aircraft you would, but in the, uh, in the sim it doesn't seem to matter too much. So yeah, that's it. Really what we want to see is that our first waypoint is the one that we're going to, so we just need to verify that. So we're going Invercargill user, and basically user 
is uh, just means that it's a user entered waypoint and in this case it's pretty much the departure end of the runway and then it'll take us to this flyover point of november victor 404 okay so this is it so uh, i'm just going to turn off this little map inset because it's too small to be of use and uh, i just find it pretty much useless doesn't offer me any value whatsoever one thing i'll just uh, well we can talk about a couple of other things as we go so let's get underway so we're just going to climb out uh, initially. If we do have an engine failure, well, we've just got to go straight ahead within sort of 15, 20 degrees of the runway heading here. Otherwise, if we have some sort of uh, other emergency, which uh, is not engine related, or the engine's still running, then we'll just bring it straight back here. Um, the, you can see it's definitely favoring 04, so we'll be looking to come back here on 04. Okay, so without further ado, let's uh, get this thing going. So I've got the brakes on. I'm just going to increase the torque here. So the technique for the takeoff, basically, um, very easy to over -talk these things and ITT. I'm not sure whether it will be torque or ITT limited. Um, the temperature is pretty low, 6 degrees OAT at the moment. So uh, that means we should be torque limited, not ITT limited. But just because that's how it should work doesn't mean it will, right? Because this is flight sim and things are always a little bit of a compromise. So what I do is I go bang, full power, and then I just crack, knock it back a bit. And uh, that's fine. And as everything's sealed down okay so we can see it is ITT limited now believe me it won't be in the real aircraft so I'm just going to bring that back because uh, uh, yeah so I mean you once we get rolling it'll cool down but it's not realistically modeled at all which is a bit frustrating so we've got to increase our torque a bit as we roll ITT still too high okay airspeed's alive so we'll just regard the ITT add a bit more torque and I'll be looking to rotate at 90 knots. Okay, everything's good, no messages, except for the uh, ITT as discussed. So rotating there. So now I'm just pitching up into the command bar, tap the brakes, travel the gear. So gear's going up. Okay, so you can see that that initial climb attitude's set at 10 degrees. So I'm just, I know I've got lateral guidance for my flight plan, so I just keep the wings more or less level. And I'm just holding it on the command bars. Once I get through about uh, 500 feet, I'll raise the flaps. So that's now. So flaps are traveling up. Okay, I'll bring the uh, power back a bit. Okay, so now uh, you can see we've got a bit of a pitch change with the flaps. And I'm just holding that 10 degrees through 1,000 feet. And the aircraft's accelerating, which is great. So what I'm going to do is once it gets to about 140 knots or so, I will hit flight, it will change. Okay, so that's coming up now. So flight level change is here. In fact, I'll do the yaw damper first and then let's go flight level change and you see it captures the speed I've got. Okay, don't worry about the fact that my command bar's gone. It'll come back eventually. Okay, and now it's indicating a pitch attitude to maintain 140 knots. So I just fly that flight director. And okay, so we've got the turn there. So I'll gauge autopilot and slowly let the stick off to minimize any changes in trim. Okay, so it's rolling right now to track to that flyover waypoint. And it's gonna maintain a climb around 138 knots. I can uh, just tap that up to 140 manually. And that's a nice smooth way to do the departure, given the limitations in the pitch axis in this thing, of course. So we can see the gear is up and the flaps are up. We've just passed November 404, so we're to EPDAB now, so all is good in the hood and uh, at about 4,000 feet at EPDAB, so we're clearly going to make that no problem at all. You can see we've got quite a bit of wind here, 38 knots behind us. We're on our way, so uh, I will turn off the landing lights. We've still got our pulse lights on, and I can turn off the initial separator as well. And when we do that, as that travels, so the cast message has gone out, and we're going to see a change. We'll probably have an ITT exceedance as that thing uh, closes or opens technically. We'll just see how it looks. But so far, so good. So we're just sitting at the top of the green. Now, in a turboprop, uh, you can see that torque's increasing, so I'm going to start to bring that back. We've really got to monitor these things. And look, without an auto throttle, okay, I'll sink the heading bug. Without an auto throttle, you don't want to get too obsessed about a precise figure okay if it's 95 97 93 it doesn't really matter because the most important thing is not to overheat or over torque the engine so uh, because it changes quite a bit as the temperature changes in the climb and things then it's uh, kind of important really just to 
keep it below the range and it's moving around so much it's hard to be precise so don't get too carried away with a specific power setting that's why it's just a big green range without indicated sort of points you know it's just like the numbers here to tell you what it is but as long as you're somewhere in the top of the green you know you're getting more or less full power without cooking the engine okay so now we're, we're a bit higher we can uh, start to increase our speed so we'll bring it up to 160 and you can see we do get quite a abrupt uh, sort of nose down pitch moment as the aircraft accelerates and now it's trying to catch it as it sees it accelerating to 160 so it's actually not doing a bad job but the real aircraft is the same so sometimes it can be smoother to just go to VS and then uh, go back into flight level change so rather than using flight level change for changing speed just use it once you're at the speed to hold the attitude for that speed if you know what I mean so uh, it's just a bit of a technique um, if you're in the aircraft and you felt that pitch change it would feel quite abrupt so you'd just sort of get used to doing whatever feels smoothest for you and your passengers so uh, we're on our way to EPDAB here this thing's climbing like a rocket 2300 feet a minute which is great and yeah we're really going for it you can see we've got a nice ground speed over 200 knots already with that tailwind so things happen pretty fast on this uh, this sector to be honest Okay, so by now we would have been handed off to uh, Christchurch Control, 1290 small 3, so it would have been talking to them, they'd probably clear us up to our cruise altitude there. In New Zealand the transition altitude is 13,000 feet, so that's the point we'd change to 1013 or 2992 and be in a flight level. And then uh, the transition level coming down is flight level 150, so we can't cruise between 13 and 15, so we can't cruise at 14 for instance. We can only cruise at either 13,000 feet or the lowest level is flight level 150. As I've mentioned in a previous video, New Zealand being more or less a north-south oriented country means that cruising levels uh, follow a north-south pattern rather than a west-east. And so it's even going south and odd going north. So uh, because we're on a more or less a northerly track, then it's uh, lowest uh, cruise for us is 13,000 feet to 13,000 feet, which is what we're doing. We're almost there. So we've got plenty of time to settle into a bit of a cruise Okay, so everything's good. Um, yeah, so we'd nav. Flight would change at 160 knots, so cannot complain. Because it's quite cold, uh, okay, it's 1,000 feet to go. We, um, yeah, very clear day, actually. Lovely weather. So we just need to uh, be a bit mindful of uh, going to any cloud. We'd need the icing on, but the stage looks like we might be BMC for the whole flight, which is good news. So we're starting to level off and I am so you can see the torque sitting here around 90 it's fine I don't care you know I'm not going to try and get 99 out of it, it doesn't matter it's just slowly going to get there and uh, the engine's in good shape all right Ep-dab. oh dear okay I'm just going to go to heading mode it's a nice simism there I did delete that waypoint didn't I but for some reason we can see here we've got the magenta sector, EPDAB to L box, so it's showing us that's the active sector, or active waypoint should be L box, but not here. So we've got a discrepancy between the what the aircraft is doing and what the map is showing, and that really is frustrating. So uh, what we can do is uh, go direct to, let's just see, EPDAB to L box, okay, so I've activated so I've gone activate leg two waypoint, so that means I want to activate this sector from EPDAB to LBOX, which it has done. And I'll go back to NAV. It's going to do quite a harsh left turn to capture the track again. But uh, yeah, that sort of stuff does happen in the real aircraft, to be honest. Maybe not a TBM, but in some aircraft. I mean, avionics packages are extremely complicated bits of kit, so uh, you never quite know what's going to happen. So that's why you just can't trust that the thing is always going to do what you expect it to do you do have to be ready to go up and down through the layers of automation so by that I mean that let's say an FMS mode here that's the highest level of automation for the uh, uh, lateral mode because it's looking at the computer for planned waypoints and so on you can see this sector should be magenta like it was before but it's not now so that's annoying uh, and the reason is actually is because you can see it's showing EPDAB to EPDAB as opposed to EPDAB to LBOX. So there's a discrepancy between what we see here and what we see here. And clearly the aeroplane's actually looking at this. So we'll just monitor that. So slight inaccuracy there.
I did this sector before actually as a, just a trial run and it worked perfectly but you know this is how it goes as I'm saying you've got to be ready and flexible to just jump in and do what you need to do. So as I mentioned nav FMS mode is the highest level because it's looking at what we've programmed and uh, that's it whereas uh, we can go down a level of automation to heading mode and then it's of course it's just going to fly the heading bug what we have uh, where we're pointing the airplane. And then we can go down one step further, we can go out of that and then you'll just get roll mode and then it's basically just going to be a, a wing leveler, it's just going to keep the wings level. So those, and then of course there's autopilot off, so there's different levels of automation which we use at different times and we have to be comfortable going up and down through those levels uh, as we um, need to. Okay, so we're in a bit of a cruise here, 230 knots indicated, I'll just come back to 80% on the torque. Um, as is common with a lot of these sort of uh, single turbo props and or even twins these days as well. We have one single power lever, so it's like a FADEC equipped aircraft. It's going to just govern the prop to 2000 RPM. And we're not looking at foot pounds. Torque is normally measured in foot pounds, but uh, like in a King Air or older King Airs, but um, you know, we just get this percentage like a Cirrus and the Diamond aircraft. So that just gives you a percentage of uh, maximum. So again, that's why it's not so important what the actual number is, whether it's 81 or 83 or 97, it's just like you're roughly getting the power that you want. Okay. Cool. So we're on our way here. Uh, let's have a look at what sector is actually active. So I'll just zoom this out. Yeah, so this is all weird. So this is showing the sector from Manop to this point here, whichever one that is. Oops. Is actually uh, and up to Bipov is the active set waypoint sector, which is so that there's three different things going on. We've got IPDAB to LBOX going, uh, is what the aircraft's flying, which is what we want. So this sector should be magenta, but it's not. Then here it's showing that we're on IPDAB to IPDAB, which is way back here, and that's not even a sector. And it's actually the one that is highlighted in magenta. That's showing that this is active is Manop to uh, Bipov. So, yeah, just weirdness, general flight sim weirdness, but it's all right. We can figure it out here because we have the technology. Just point out a couple of features on here. So, AOA, um, you can see this is like a target AOA here, and this is obviously going to be a stall. Sometimes they give you a number, so one will be the stall, like 1.0, and anything less is sort of showing you what percentage of maximum lift the wing is able to produce. So this is probably set on site 0.7, which is an optimum angle of attack for the aircraft or something like that. Okay, then uh, this green one here is also important. This comes up when you turn the terrain on, and this is the flight path vector that's showing where the energy of the aircraft is pointing. So with a bit of crosswind, you can see it's not going to be directly in front of the nose. It's going to be showing that we're actually drifting off to one side. Uh, it's a little bit hard to explain when it's straight level like this, but more... Um, uh, evident once we uh, uh, start operating closer to the ground, say in the uh, landing phase. Ground speed of 300 knots, very good. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Even at this low altitude, yeah, humming along. So it's still nice and clear. In fact, very clear, lovely day. So this uh, part of the country, New Zealand, Southland, is as you can see, it's mostly a rural farming area. Sheep and beef farming down here. And uh, yeah, looking out to the east is the Pacific Ocean, heading into the Southern Ocean. So head sort of that way for a while and you've eventually, well there's a couple of islands here and there, but eventually next stop Antarctica. So it does get pretty chilly down here in the winter months. But of course it is uh, late spring or mid spring in New Zealand at the moment. I actually did my multi-engine instrument rating uh, many years ago at Dunedin. And uh, you can see it's got this whole load of NDBs. There's just loads of them. Burydale, Henley, uh, Mosgiel. And uh, so you do these twin NDB approaches. And I did it in a Seneca and a, a TB10 Tobago, I think it was. And uh, yeah, trying to fly a single pilot uh, twin NDB approach without any of this gadgetry, it's all steam gauges, uh, was quite an experience, I can tell you. And pretty much nothing like this at all so we've got it pretty good even with a system that doesn't really work properly huh, now we've got our magenta sector working so it seems to be slowly catching up
now we're L-box to man up. So now we're sort of, our Magenta's one behind, but even so, even a half-functioning version of this is better than not having any of it at all. So the next thing to think about, of course, is going to be the descent. We did brief the approach before. This Magenta's jumping all over the place. Uh, the uh, star, so it was to cross. Uh, let's see, we could see the constraint in here, can't we? So it's at gas 5,000 feet and uh, 220 knots or, or below. So we can just work back from there. So we've got 8,000 feet to lose. Now, I have been through some complicated uh, calculations, really. We look at ground speed and time and so on. But just for the sake of, um, you know, we're just doing this fairly rough around the edges. We know we've got 8,000 feet to lose. We'll just times it by three. So let's say 24 miles. So uh, basically 24 miles prior to ADCAS is uh, going to be our top of descent. And we can see that the sector from, uh, let's have a look here, from, uh, uh, so from Blosco to ADCAS is 20 miles. And uh, sorry, Bipa to Losco is 20 miles, and then Losco to Adcas is 5 miles. So that basically means that when we cross Bipa for about 25 miles from Adcas, so let's just make a top of descent Bipa, and that's nice and easy. It's I don't have to worry about a specific distance. I can just say at Bipa we're going to make our way down, and we'll just modulate our vertical uh, speed to get us more or less where we want to go. So if we're a bit low, we'll just uh, reduce the rate of descent so that we do not go below 5,000 feet until ADCAS. Uh, well, we'll set 5,000 anyway, so we won't go below it. So we can just do it nice and simple like that. We don't have to get too complicated with times and all the rest of it. Uh, you might have been wondering, this little blue needle here, this is something we can turn on in the uh, settings. Map settings um, is, uh, let's see if we can find it. May not buy pub. okay. Getting a bit of a change. Anyway, it's uh, trying to find it was around here somewhere. Map settings, terrain. Okay, I, I can't remember where it was, but it's basically uh, other. Oh yeah, track vector. That's it. So this is showing us where the airplane will be in 60 seconds, and we can change that. So 30 seconds, you can see it's a lot shorter. Or two minutes, it's going to be a lot longer. So two minutes is actually quite handy. We get this range ring as well to show our uh, time that uh, how far we'll go until we're within uh, 45 minutes of like running out of gas basically. So there's some pretty cool features with this um, and range to altitude. Uh, so that should give us what we'd call a green banana. I haven't tried that before as you can see it was turned off so let's see what happens. So there's a bunch of um, settings you can play around with there. Uh, the other one I was going to show you was, uh, sorry, the... Yeah, terrain. So basically absolute is the color coding is based on um, just what these altitudes are above sea level. But we can make it relative. So it will now it will change so that only the colors come in if um, based on their level relative to us. But I prefer absolute because I can clearly see there's higher terrain here, a bit of higher terrain there. All right, we're approaching uh, Bipov. It's only four miles to go now. So uh, we'll come back to our flight plan. Yeah, it's a shame that uh, this is discrepant, but we just have to really fly it from here so we know what's going on. So uh, I may well just do this whole video again, but if uh, to do it properly, okay, there's bipod. So let's start our descent. So we'll set this at 5,000 feet. I know that as long as I'm on that airway or the tracks uh, on that star, I should say, that I'm going to be above those MSAs. So we'll reduce the power a bit, vertical speed, and we'll just start it way down at, uh, let's say, 1,500 feet a minute initially, and we'll see how we go, because we're going to accelerate a bit in this descent. Okay, so the airport is down in this valley here, the Tyree River Valley. Okay, cool. So that's, um, in the aircraft I fly for a living, we have one of these, and it's green, so we call it the green banana, but that's showing the point at which we're going to reach our target uh, altitude pre-select there. So now it's even better. So I can just uh, basically modulate my vertical speed to get that f sitting on ADCAS. So you can see there's a bit of turbulence, so that's fluctuating around. But you can see it's sort of within the ballpark, isn't it? So 1,500 feet a minute is pretty good. As our speed changes, that'll obviously move around as well. So all good. You see we've got this uh, pretty strong tailwind behind us. 
so uh, that has increased our ground speed so it's still over 300 knots so definitely something to keep in mind but having all these toys you don't really have to think about it I don't have to calculate how many knots of ground speed do I have and so on I'll just pretty much put that there and I'm gonna be okay so you get all these really cool toys uh, in this very fun aeroplane to fly okay line the heading bug there so you can see I'm in that habit of whenever we turn just keeping that heading bug aligned because if I have a uh, FMS problem like I did before where the aeroplane just starts going off one way I don't want it to go as long as I've got the heading bug aligned I can just quickly push heading boom and now I've got control of the autopilot again and the aeroplane's doing what I want it to do 20 miles to swampy uh, what I can do is turn on the nav 1 and you can see I've actually got India Delta November to be honest most aircraft uh, you cannot have the um, ILS set up as an RMI needle like that that just doesn't work because it's it's not transmitting its position as a bearing like a VOR oh, it's just dropped off anyway so yeah just something to keep in mind I mean it's actually kind of handy that it works in the sim because now I can get a DME distance but in real life it doesn't work like that oh yeah we can set up our minimums so we'll do 260 feet and barrow you can see there's a couple of options, radio altitude, so that's obviously going to be uh, based on red alt above the ground or barrow. So uh, we'll use uh, barrow 260 as our minimum, which we talked about before. I haven't gone back to my charts to brief that. I'm going to just uh, make a V approach speed of 100 knots. So, and we'll turn that bug on. Okay, so we're going to get a bug. And you can see it's starred because it's showing that that is a uh, non-standard sort of uh, setting that I've put in there. Bit of turbulence over the hills here okay so what I, if anything what I do want to see is that my altitude is before ACBAS because I'm going pretty quick so I want to have time to start decelerating so ideally I want to be uh, level before ACDAS so I can come back to that 220 knots if I am um, too steep then I can't go down and slow down at the same time so I want to be level before the waypoint so I've got a short level sector where I can reduce the power and the aircraft will decelerate so the airport will be out here. Let's uh, jump outside. I'm always a bit reluctant in case the thing crashes because sometimes it does. So let's have a look. Okay, so that's the town of uh, Mosgiel there. And there's the airport just down here. There's another little grass airfield uh, just here. This is called Tyree. Yeah, so here's uh, Port Chalmers and uh, the city of Dunedin is just in here. There's Tyree here. All right. So, so far, so good. We are getting pretty close to uh, ACDAS. And, uh, yeah, we're getting smashed around here. So I'm just going to reduce the power, bring the speed back a bit because it is very bumpy, as you can see. And we can see our rate of uh, descent here. The cabin pressurization is good. So now we've descended. We're lower than the, uh, the cabin altitude. So the cabin is descending at 500 feet a minute, which is actually... Yeah, it's probably all right, but you definitely notice that. You'd be clearing your ears, let's put it that way. So we've got five miles to Actas, uh, so about a minute away. I'm going to start to zoom in on the display so I can see what's going on. Okay, I've got that ILS uh, there, which I mentioned before. Okay, I've got a thousand feet to go. So we're going to be level 5,000 feet. We're under 220 knots, so uh, yeah, all good. Okay, q &H is just recalibrated there. And we can see when I turn the barrow minimum on, I didn't mention it before, but we can see we've got uh, 260 feet is bugged there, and we should actually see that on the altimeter on the way down. This G is referring to if we were doing a GPS approach, but we're not, so we can disregard that. Okay, so we are passing ACDAS, and now we can go to not above 4,000 feet by BIGAR. So we'll set that and continue our descent in VS. But I am going to just do this one at a lower rate of descent. So about 800 feet a minute is fine. So it's going to take us about a minute <coughs> to get 1,000 feet to go. And we've got about a minute to get to BIGAR, so all good. Okay, as we start the turn, I will just bring that heading bug around, like so. You can see we're flying into an increasing tailwind, so everything's happening pretty quick now, because whatever we're looking at here, we've got an extra 30 knots pushing us along. So we do need to be mindful of that. 
but the speed's good. It's back under 200 knots, so I'm happy with that. Uh, we're not going to slow down until pretty late on the approach because we can slow down pretty quick in a turboprop. So I'm going to keep this thing clean, uh, meaning no gear or no flaps until pretty much passing Tyree. Then we'll do some flaps, but we'll just see how it looks when we get a bit closer. We can see this big needle, the fat one, is pointing at swampy VOR here. So that's just good for our SA, our situational awareness, to let us know kind of where we are in relation to the uh, uh, the approach. Uh, one thing I'm not sure about is what the inbound course is going to be set to. So we'll just have to wait. Okay, leveling at 4000, so it's not below 4000 at bigger, we're at 4000 at bigger. And now we can come down to 3500 for the platform altitude. This I will do very slowly at uh, 400 feet a minute. Cool. So now we're tracking to ESCAT, which is the uh, final, uh, sorry, the initial approach fix, if you remember rightly. And uh, shortly, you can see that this is uh, the flight path vector there is um, quite a long way behind the nose because we've got this crosswind now blowing us from the right. Okay. All right, cool. So. Uh, on track to Escat, two miles away. So this is a good time to basically sync the heading bug. All right, go into heading mode, and now I'm going to change the nav source to nav one. I'm going to check my inbound course is on two one zero, which it is. I'm going to arm approach. I have okay, locus captured. Technically, in the real aircraft, it wouldn't chase it like that. It would wait till it comes in and then capture it. So it should have stayed in heading until the loc actually comes in. It won't go out like a GPS and capture that. So that's incorrect. The glide slope is armed. We can see there's our glide there. We're just coming out one dot below. So that's in good shape. So uh, we should see ourselves capture that if we um, uh, if we get to 3,500 feet and haven't captured it, then we would need to drive it down. But so far, so good. Okay, align the heading bug again. We are at 12 miles, so life is good. So we should have a pretty much reached 3,500 feet as it captures the glide slope, so there'll be no level segment here. So now we're just looking for that GS to become our active mode. So now we're capturing 3,500 feet. And like I said, if we, there it goes, bang. Okay, that's a really rough transition onto the glide slope shouldn't be that rough but anyway so now we've on look on glide so we're in approach mode now uh, swampy's behind us so we can turn that off because it's just a distraction now right okay and oops that's it so have a look we should see a runway out there somewhere you know you boys send an aircraft carrier around here there it is fantastic there's uh, Tyree airport just down here you can see the two crossing grass runways and we just got that bong to show us that we've deviated from our pre-selected altitude, but I can just crack that off and set it back to 3,500 feet for the missed approach. And now we won't have to worry about that flashing and showing us anything else. So we're still humming along here, 190 knots on the approach, but we are at nine miles, it's fine. So uh, you'll see, we can slow this thing down pretty quick. The top speed is placarded here to put out the first stage of flaps is, uh, so flaps extended, so VFE, maximum uh, velocity, the flaps extended, takeoff configuration, 178 knots. So basically, any time below 178 knots, we can put out that first stage of flaps. So I will reduce the power, and we're just now looking to travel under, say, 180, back under one, maybe 170. So you can see, as soon as I close the power lever, boom, we just start decelerating, because there's a lot of drag in the disc of a propeller compared to a jet, which just doesn't have that drag. So a props our speed brake. That's why we don't normally see speed brakes on a turboprop aircraft. So now we're in that flap operating range. So any time we can configure, as soon as we put that flap out, boom, the speed's going to come right back. So uh, we don't need to uh, worry too much about going fast. We've got ready altimeters alive. So this is showing us that we're getting close to the ground. So if we had our barrow set at RA, it'll be looking at this figure as opposed to this figure. Out of marker, most of the, um, the markers around the world have been decommissioned these days, but it's kind of nice for old time's sake. So the outer mark is always blue, and uh, if I turned the audio on, you'd get a do do do, and the next one there's actually going to be a middle marker, and it comes up with a yellow M. And it goes dee 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 dee, or dee 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 dee, something like that. I forgot. It's been so long because we don't use them anymore. Okay, so we, we can see we've got uh, um, our runway in front there. Looks like three reds and one white on the puppy, but we're on, on glide. We're in good shape. All right, I'm going to start configuring. So flaps. 
set to take off. You can see we get a pitch change, so autopilot should eventually correct for that, and the speed will come back. Let's check our gear travel speed. So landing gear operating speed uh, down, 178 knots, and then 178 extended. So we can put the gear down any time. I will do that. So gear travels. Okay, initial set. Let's pop that on. So you can see the flashing light in the handle and the gear unsafe. So there's two indications that the gear's not down. So you're not just looking for three greens, you're also looking for those lights to go out as well, which they have. Okay, let's uh, stop at 120 knots, and that's the top of our uh, landing flat range. All right, I'm just going to get myself organized here. So I've just increased power for 120 knots, and I'm going to kick off the autopilot. So just give me a sec while I get my uh, eye position sorted and my uh, track IR sorted. Let's pop the landing light on. Okay, here we go. Right, track IRs off, there's the initial sip on. Okay, we go full flaps and autopilot yaw dampers off. Oh, big pitch change with trim, so she's out of trim. Okay, increasing power now, as soon as I put the flaps down. We've got two whites, two reds. 500, 500 feet, we're stabilized on low on glide. And uh, you can see we've actually got a bit of quarter and tailwind there. When I flew this earlier, it was runway 2-1. But it looks like it's only five knots, so normally it's most aircraft, uh, it's sort of ten knot maximum tailwind limitation, so we're good to go. So I'm just keeping it fairly quick, just keeps it pretty positive uh, control. There you go, there's that middle marker we can actually hear at this time. I hope you can. Okay, so as we pass 260, you can see that yellow um, little mark there showing the 260, and that's gone amber to let us know we're below the minimum. So we'd say visual, we're visual with the runway, or the runway environment, the lights and so on. Continue, getting a bit high, I'll reduce the power. I'm just now aiming for those big fat white touchdown zone markers. Got a bit of crosswind from right to left. I'm not pulling the power off too early in a turboprop because you get a big nose down pitch moment. Okay, there we go, powers to idle. Just hold it, hold it, hold it, bit of left rudder. Touchdown. Okay, into reverse. Not much braking. Let the prop do the work. The taxiway is behind us, so we're not really trying to make a taxiway. Okay, I just increased the power to come out of reverse, and that's it. We made it. So, uh, yeah, that was a quick flight from uh, Invercargill to Dunedin in an IFR sort of way. And, um, yeah, obviously I wasn't sort of doing checklists along the way there, but uh, it's generally just a matter of keeping aware of what's going on with the airplane and uh, being ready to intervene, take over from the autopilot. So you can see we had some discrepancies with the flight plan, the way it was being depicted. But once we understood what the problem was, then we could just work within that, right, and uh, manage the manage the aircraft. And it worked out pretty well not to select an approach in the GPS, because unless you're flying an ANEB approach, you know, the, then selecting the ILS approach in the GPS doesn't really give you much because you're going to change over to what we call green needles or the, uh, the ILS data anyway. So really we only needed the GPS to get us to the initial approach fix um, with SCAP, was it? And uh, from there on in, we're just flying it with reference to the ILS anyway. So as we come off the runway, we turn our strobes off and taxi lights on, pulse lights go off. There it goes. I'm just going to park over by the fuel pump here. So we've got this sort of random taxiway system here in Dunedin. Uh, there's actually a um, custom scenery some of the guys in New Zealand have made for Dunedin, which I don't have installed, as you can see. This is the default, so I recommend hunting that down uh, if you want to improve the scenery in Dunedin and recreate this flight. So just a reminder there, I've got the G3000 community f um, working title uh, mod on the TBM 930, and I've also installed a, uh, a, an update. And to be honest, I, I think it's... It feels pretty good. Um, those engine indications on the takeoff of the ITT out of phase with the uh, with the temperature is kind of annoying, but it's just not unusual. Uh, so far, the turboprop modelling is not great, but I've never found a sim so far that actually models turboprops properly with the drag on the disc and beta mode and the way that the uh, engine instruments sort of change and all that stuff. So, yeah, it's a pretty good replication, but certainly not accurate. 
uh, pack breaker sets cancel the warning and uh, bleeder goes off so yeah this just gives you a bit of an idea I went through things pretty quickly but hopefully um, it gave you a bit of an insight into what you can do you know with the sim we'll go to uh, transponder standby so you know it still has its problems pedo heats off I would have turned those off leaving the runway in the rear aircraft but it's a lot easier just to reach your hand up and pop the switches than it is to fiddle around with the mouse in the sim so yeah, that's uh, really all I can um, offer you for this one. Any specific questions? I probably messed some things up, but uh, hopefully you got a bit of a feel for how it's done. And um, yeah, the, the most important thing is we don't have to overcomplicate it. Just stay with the aircraft. Think ahead, plan, what, keep an eye on what's happening, what you're expecting it to do. And if it's not doing it, then stop it. Okay, that's all there is to it. Shut it down. And uh, it's a yeah, really cool aeroplane, good fun to fly. So, uh, um, yeah, I recommend getting this uh, um, this G3000 mod, that's for sure, because it, it definitely makes it uh, a lot more realistic with the heating up and the terrain and uh, different uh, ways of depicting like that altitude uh, prediction. Really cool. Yeah, that line. It should disappear, shouldn't it? Because we're not going to be there in two minutes. We're not going to be anywhere. All right, that's it. Thank you for watching. We will uh, talk to you again soon. Cheers.